My name is John Sylvester. I'm Australia's longest serving crime reporter and write a weekly column for The Age. Many of my colleagues have wondered why I've never bothered to move to other areas of the paper. The reason's pretty simple. I've got the best job in journalism, playing cops and robbers and getting paid for it. Over more than 40 years, I've covered some of Australia's biggest crimes and met fascinating characters on both sides of the law. In this series, you'll hear from them, the cops and the crooks, telling their stories. Welcome to my world. Welcome to Naked City. Hello. I want to warn you that some of this content is extremely graphic. It's certainly not suitable for children. When we hear that a crook has been sent to jail for a crime, it's easy to think that it all finishes there. But what happens once the crooks are inside jail? What is life like inside that secret world? It's like going to a bad party. They don't want you there and they're letting you know they don't want you there. Our prisons can be places of violence, pain and death. And Lewis was saying to me under his breath, like, stop moving, you know, because he had to mop up the blood. The jail has its own ecosystem and the people locked up can be darkly ingenious. Like, who would have thought you'd use jam as a weapon? You know, but yeah, they do jam, sugar, anything that'll thicken, you know, the water and then when they burn you, it's double the effect. Our prisons are home to some pretty colourful characters. He's the most entertaining bloke I ever... I used to tell him, you should write a book. Paul O'Sullivan is a tough man. You have to be to spend 20 years with Australia's most hardened criminals. A boxer and a fighter as a young man, Paul had his own brushes with the law. Over the years, he's seen every kind of criminal come through the gates. He's seen plenty of dead bodies, witnessed murders, and he's even had his own throat cut. When I sat down and talked with him, Paul was remarkably frank. I found the best way was to treat him as if you'd treat anybody. Like, why would they respect me if I didn't respect them? You know, if I didn't say please and thank you, why should they? So I made a point of always saying please and thank you. And, you know, I didn't bother in my own head about what they'd done. Because it's not for me to judge them. Like, you're told that on, on your learning thing. You're told that you're not there to judge them. You're actually there to help them. And that's what you're meant to do. I don't believe jail's black and white. I never have. It's meant to be, but it's not. You're dealing with people. You know, there's reasons why they're incarcerated. It's not always because they're bad. It's, it's a lot of it is the situation. You know, um, if you're born into a family of um, criminals, what hope have you got? Paul started out boxing at a young age. Um, all my life I loved it. I remember like sneaking out of bed and uh, going down watching my dad watching TV ringside, you know, in the very early days. And, you know, I'd be just watching it and I'd, you know, I'd be sort of crouching down so nobody could see me and just watching the fights and I was always like interested in it. Uh, when I got my first job, like I left school at 15, the first thing I bought with my first pay pack was a pair of boxing gloves. Lured by pay and conditions, Paul started working as a prison officer in 1999. Being a boxer, he could look after himself in most circumstances. His first job was in one of Australia's toughest prison units, Scarborough North. It was an eye-opener. It was like going into a zoo. You know, all the prisoners would be lined up on the fences, yelling insults at you. The first time I walked in, it looked like a boys' camp because they had swimming pools and tennis courts. There were guys sunbaking, playing tennis, and you're thinking, this is jail. You know, like, I thought, this is like when you go to a camp at school. You know, and then you got these uh, blokes lining up, just yelling insults at you. And, you know, it's a bit daunting when you first go in. And then, after a while, like, it's, it's easy. You know, like, my cousin used to ask me about it, and I said, it's like going to a bad party. You know, where you go to a party and you don't know anyone, and everybody's sort of giving you dirty looks and all that? I said, it's just like that. It's like they don't want you there, and they're letting you know they don't want you there, but it's up to you how you take it, you know? Like, 
Prison officers work what is called the line. This line was the toughest in the prison. And only six months into the job, there was a day which would be his worst. Yeah, April the 30th it was. Um, I got a line in Scarborough North, which was called, the crooks used to call it the Bronx. Uh, we called it the Unenlightened. Uh, it was where all the ones that were consistently causing trouble couldn't fit in with the, the general population, with the rules of the prison and that. The guys who were just, you know, out and out um, there to disrupt everything. So they put them in one particular unit and that was it. And anyway, the supervisor of that unit offered me a line in there and I took it. One day, one of the guys come up to me and wanted to see the psych nurse. This particular prisoner had warned staff he was going to do something. Now, you only have two options for the psych nurse if you need to see him without going through the proper process, which is putting in a form and all that, then you either have to be on the brink of self-harm or you're going to hurt somebody else. So he knew that, I knew that. I said that to him. He said, yep, I'm going to do one or the other. And so I called the psych nurse and the psych nurse said over the phone, OK, you can send him up, but you've got to get an officer to come with him an officer to stay with him when he's here, and he's not staying here any longer than that. And so we did that. Uh, the officer brought him back and then told me, look, when he left, he was making threats. He said, you watch what I'll do now. And anyway, so he came back into the unit. Then about probably 20 minutes later, I felt someone grab me from behind and then just cut across my throat like that. And so then- He was still behind you? Yeah. What they used to use in those days, they had toothbrushes and they'd melt the end of it and then they would just break a blade off their shaver, stick the blade in and as the toothbrush hardened it was like a Stanley knife. So it's a pretty good weapon and anyway he slashed right across and then he ran away screaming at me, you effing dog, you know, uh, so like for a few seconds, I was just sort of wondering what had happened. Then I saw all the blood, so I went straight after him. Then the crooks blocked the stairs, and he was standing up on the top tier with a guy called Stephen Asling. And, you know, he was sort of hiding behind Asling. And the other prisoners had blocked everything off, and they started to arm up with weapons. While Paul was bleeding, he was still locking down the prison. There was blood everywhere. I didn't leave the unit straight away. I was told to leave. I, I wouldn't leave. We were locking down anyone that would lock down. Most of them wouldn't. And then it got to a stage where the duty supervisor, Chris Plummer, gave me a direct order to leave and go to the hospital. Must have been plenty of blood. Yeah. There was a prisoner, Lewis Kane, who was following me around with a mop because he was the head billet in the unit. And Lewis was saying to me under his breath, like, stop moving, you know, because he had to mop up the blood. On the outside, when he wasn't mopping up blood, Lewis Kane was a fearsome gangland figure. Paul developed a working relationship with Lewis. They respected each other. At that stage, Lewis Kane ran that unit with an iron fist. You know, when I started, Lewis came to me and said, you don't hire the billets here, I do. And I, I just said, what? And he goes, I hire him because I'll fire him. If you have a problem with someone, you tell me, and then I'll fix it. And then one night I saw what happened was we had a billet who wasn't doing anything, and we saw Lewis go into his cell, and then all you saw was one shadow hitting another shadow. And then Lewis come out and said, I've just sacked this guy, and I'm going to give this guy a job. So, you know, it worked for us. In the jail, Lewis was probably just about the most fearsome guy there. We had Richard Mladenich come in. Now, Lewis had it all over him because Richard used to play his music loud at all times and we put him in the cell under Lewis and Lewis didn't put up with that. Anyway, the next day, Lewis got out of his cell, come down, opened Richard's cell and just belted the Christ out of him. And he was a big bloke. Richard was fearsome. Like so many others, Lewis ended up the casualty of the gangland wars, murdered by members of a hit team. 
He thought they were his friends until they shot him dead in a car. Having his throat cut turned Paul into a legend and he got the respect of the prisoners. Pretty hard way to do it. It become a legend, John. It's funny because the truth was I didn't do anything, you know. Like, I stayed there and I kept locking them down and I refused to leave and I tried to get up the stairs to get the guy and the crooks wouldn't let me and then it turned into, like, you know, the urban legends. Since then, you know, over the 20 years since, I've had prisoners come up and say, oh, I heard you got him and you flogged the shit out of him and, you know, then you went back to work the next day and, and nothing happened. Well, I wanted to go back to work the next day because I had overtime, but they wouldn't let me until the stitches come out. So I came back to work within a week and I was put back in Scarb North, which I wanted. And um, in hindsight, it was the best thing I ever did. Because I had so many people saying to me, oh, you can milk this, you can get this, you can do that. But the best thing I ever did was, went, was come straight back and go straight back into that unit. Because it just, it created, like you said, it, it made me over the years, oh, he's the bloke who had his throat cut, you know. Officers would sometimes take the law into their own hands with dealing with particularly troublesome prisoners. And there was a, a system, wasn't there, that um, if prisoners arced up, they were, they were taken to the visitors' room? Yeah, there, there was a couple of places uh, where prisoners would be called to and there'd be a, a group of officers that would meet them and just bash them. So that was part of getting the jail back, back under control. Because you, you can't punish people who don't take punishment as punishment. You have to punish them in ways they understand. And these guys only understand violence because that's how they deal with things themselves. You know, it's no good giving a guy a lecture and, and taking his TV when all he's going to do is do exactly the same. And what they used to do then was they'd take the TV off somebody else. You know, in jails, the jungle. You know, the strong survive, the weak don't. You know, if I go and take the heaviest bloke in the unit's TV, he just goes and takes somebody else's. He still has his TV. What would, you, what would they say when you said you've got to go to the visitor's room and they knew they weren't getting a visitor? They'd ask you. They'd say straight out, why? And you'd say, because you've been called up. And they'd say, am I going to get a hiding? And you'd just say, I don't know. You know, that was how I dealt with it. Because I wasn't told why. I Like, I... In my own head, I thought I knew why, but, you know, I just... Because I always believe in telling the truth if you can. And, you know, you can be evasive, but I'm not going to say straight out, yes, you are, because then, of course, he's not going to go. Violence was common in prison. Paul saw an array of homemade weapons made out of some very interesting material. Anything, John, anything. The laminate, you know how most desks like that are laminated? They would pull that off, sharpen one end to a point, tape it up, and it would go straight through you. Stuff like that. It's uh, the the wire on the fences. They'd work at one one rung like the piece behind you until it comes out. It's wire, you know. Tape it up. You've got the handle, and it'll go straight into you. There's so many stabbings that happen in the jail. I've always wondered why there's not more deaths. Baked beans are considered healthy, a very good source of roughage. But in prison, baked beans and jam can be deadly. One of the ways they used to get guys was you'd go into a cell, you'd have the, the cans of baked bean in a sock and you'd have your kettle and they'd throw the hot water on the bloke's foot, you know, on, on his lower legs, which obviously takes your mind off defending yourself and then they would bake bean him over the head with the cans until they felt like he'd had enough. Then they come up with they come up with the worst one. Uh, the, the the indigenous guys were the first ones that I remember doing it. They'd boil the kettle and they'd put jam in it, and the jam it would become like napalm because you'd throw it on, and they they did this to a few guys, and you'd throw the burning kettle with the jam in it, and as it dries the skin peels with it, so it's you know and they. Once that got about, of course, that become a big thing, you know, and then we had to ban the buckets of jam that we used to put out for them 
Like who would have thought you'd use jam as a weapon? You know, but yeah, they do, jam, sugar, anything that'll thicken, you know, the water. And then when they burn you, it's double the effect. I was there when Darren Parks, he was a POW, got stabbed to death in Scarb North. I wasn't working in the unit, but I'd been in there a couple of times that day to have coffee with a friend of mine who was working in there. I knew Darren Parks pretty well. And allegedly that was over Darren's crime, which he'd shot a market gardener. Uh, and um, allegedly the Victorian Mafia put a hit out on him and a bloke called Ross Giamona stabbed him to death or stabbed him in his cell and Parks later died. He died in our, our patient's area. And um, they found the weapon in Giamona's S bend of his toilet. In 2006, Giamona stabbed Parks 16 times with a sharpened butter knife. He later claimed Parks attacked him and he was acting in self-defence. He pleaded guilty to defensive homicide and was sentenced to eight years with a minimum of six. And allegedly again, there was so much money paid into his TAB account because that was how they used to pay him off through the TAB accounts. The murders, because I liked Darren Parks, he was a good guy to talk to, you know, you could have a chat with him. And when he got murdered, I was a bit you know, because it's someone that you actually enjoyed talking to. When you don't know them, it's no big deal, you know, and um, you see, I would have seen 30 stabbings. There was a cell that got nicknamed the boxing ring? Boxing. There's a three outer in most units. In Scarborough North, that's where they used to go and settle. It's called a three outer because you have three different beds. You got two over there, one over there, there's a toilet and it's like, twice the size of a normal cell. So there's a lot of space in there. So in a normal cell, you walk in and you're very cramped. The bed's there, the toilet's there, the sink's there, the shower's there. There's not much space, you know, it's like this. Um, in the three outer, there's a big open area in the middle. So in Scarb North, they used to call it the boxing ring because what would happen, we'd hear the music go up. There'd always be someone standing at the door of the cell just watching. You know, they'd just be acting like they're doing nothing. But you'd hear the music go up and you knew that meant there was a fight going on or a bashing or something and it was always in the three outer. So the music went up for what reason? To drain out the screams. You know, because if someone was copping it and they were yelling for help or whatever, you know, the music would be blaring and, you know, because it was way down the bottom of the unit, you wouldn't hear it. So uh, they pretty switched on with how they did it, you know. Boxing was a big thing in, in prison and there was one bloke who challenged you? Yeah. Who was that? Tony Laguancio. And what's his plan to find? Well, they, they called him Mad Dog in the papers. He got out, he got killed in a siege in Keelor. Um, when I first started, Tony was one of those guys who always had to push your buttons. If you had a black dog, Tony had a blacker dog. You know, like anything you did, Tony done better. And then he found out I'd done some boxing, so he was at me, you know. Are you any good? You know, I said, oh, no, I'm all right. You know, and then he'd say, why don't we spar? i say, no, I probably shouldn't spar you. And then he goes, no, go on, we'll, we'll spar. So I fell and I said, yeah, okay. So he did it when all his mates from Scarborough North were there. And, you know, there's probably 50 of them there. And they're all yelling out, kill the dog, Tony, kill the dog. Like, and I was laughing because I was just thinking, I know what he's going to do. Like, we, we had a concrete wall there. And so I lined up with my back towards the wall because I knew Tony was going to come charging at me trying to take my head off, you know. So Tony did that, you know, the bell goes, Tony charges straight at me. I just do a little step and then I push him smack into the wall, like as hard as I could. His head clunks into the wall. He turns around like this, so I hit him once and he just falls down. And that was the end of that. And then there's just silence. Then a couple of the crooks that were yelling out, kill the dog, said, oh, I knew you'd beat him. I knew you'd beat him, you know. <laughs> And I was thinking, no, you didn't. Some criminals became celebrities. Paul knew some of them very well, particularly someone like the arm robber and master SKP, Christopher Dean Badness Bins. I found him very good. Um, hard as nails. Uh, at the start, it was shaky because Chris would always like to fight first and then work it out later. And I remember one of the other crooks was saying to me, you know, he's been eyeing you off. I said, yeah. I said, I've seen it. 
you know, because he'd always, Chris had always pushed the boundaries, you know, that in Charlotte they weren't allowed to go to other cells. Chris would always go to another cell and they had a flat and he'd lift the flat and he'd say to him, Chris, get away from the cell, you know, and then he'd give you a dirty look and then you'd go over and, you know, you'd move him on. And this would be like a constant with Chris. And after a while, like, he'd see you and you worked it out, you know, and, and we'd actually have a laugh because he found out I had American Bulldogs in those days and he had one that looked exactly like an American Bulldog. So we talk about that. And um, then he told me like a story about how he got locked up that time was his dog had got out and um, the council declared it a pit bull. Now Chris was wanted by the police at that stage so he couldn't go get it. So he sent his brother to go get it. The council wouldn't release it because it wasn't his brother's dog and they declared it a pit bull anyway, that it was a dangerous dog. So then Chris went, you know, and he said, it wasn't the smartest thing I ever did. He said, but I went down and I told him what had happened if they wouldn't give me back the dog. And he said, you know, because I made all these threats by the time I left, he said there was that many police outside. <laughs> and he said, not the smartest thing I ever done because he had body bags in the boot. and Because he was trying to kill Gavin Preston at that stage. Because he, he told me he had a tracker on Preston's car and he said I was that close. You know, so, but that was the other thing was Chris, he was always, you know, could have been a plan to escape from there. Because he was very good at escaping. Oh, in any yard you put him in, you'd watch him. The first thing he did, because we were warned about it, the first thing he did was, you know, he'd be looking at the walls, he'd be looking at, you know, you could just see his mind ticking over, it was what he would have to do to get out of this joint. And, um, yeah, but... When he got out, and it was funny, um, before he got locked up for that siege he did, when he got out that time, um, he tried to leave $600 for us, the Charlotte officers at the reception, which of course they couldn't keep. But the police had been phoning our intel department, you know, for days, because they wanted to know the exact time Chris got out so they could be on him. And anyway, there was no need for it because Chris had a stretch limo with prostitutes and that in it, and he went straight to King Street, because it was the biggest laugh of all time. There was a helicopter overhead, there was, you know, because they were determined to keep eyes at him. He the second time Binns was locked up, he'd changed. He just couldn't be managed in the mainstream prison system. Yeah. He'd been, what I heard was he'd been on ice and got heavily into it. And then when he came back to jail, he wasn't the same bloke. I didn't see him, but came back and I think he became Muslim and, and you know, there was allegations about what he was saying or whatever, I don't know. Uh, Chris couldn't go out into the mainstream. The one time they let him out into mainstream, and this is quite funny, they put him in the Scarborough North, of course, you know, and um, Chris goes in, the officers in the unit start to give him the induction into the unit, like, you know, where you explain what he's meant to do and all this. Chris said, it doesn't matter, I'm not going to be here that long puts his bag down and he said, just show me where my cell is. So I said, all right, they put him in his cell. Chris comes out, he's got his jacket on. He'd put all magazines under himself. He had one guy in there that he wanted to get, a bloke called Dougie Jackson. Chris had filled up a spray bottle with bleach. He went up to Jackson, sprayed him in the eyes with the bleach and then just started beating the Christ out of him, knowing that he was going to go straight back to the slot because he, he left his staff at the station and he'd already said to the staff I won't be here long you know and the magazines were to stop if he'd been shivved it was like it protects you you know and um, yeah he just went up and beat the Christ out of Doug and and then went back to the slot so you know he was very much if he wanted to get you he would get you you know he wasn't he wasn't scared of being locked up. You can hear more about Chris Spins in the episode titled The Crook and the Copper. If you like this podcast, subscribe and rate it. Very highly, obviously. Tell your friends. They'll love you for it. Another dangerous crim who crossed Paul's path was Greg Bluey Brazel, a ferociously intelligent psychopath, a double killer and a long-term inmate. He's the most entertaining bloke I ever... I used to tell him, you should write a book. Because we had him for a long time and, and he was the most manipulative bloke you could imagine and he would 
he was so smart, you know. You gotta give credit. Like you go in there and when you got him you were warned about him because when we first got he was very dangerous. That was in the days where he'd taken prison officers hostage and he'd, you know, done all sorts of stuff, so he was still in his in his element. And yet he was so manipulative, like he'd call me Sully, like because he'd hear the other officers calling it, and he'd try and ingratiate himself in into you know, then he'd see all the stuff that you do and he'd try and, you know, we used to have to clean the kitchen because in the state management unit we used to have to dish up the meals, so of course you had to clean up. He knew we didn't want to, so he said, I can clean the kitchen for you. You know, but why he was doing it, because then he'd help himself to the extra food, you know, so then he'd say, he'd also see on Sundays we'd get all the rations ready to give out, like their coffee, their sugar, their cereal, and... We searched his cell one day and he had about 10 tins of coffee <laughs> under his bed, more sugar than you could use in a year, you know. <laughs> there was nothing he did that wasn't for, for him. Geez, he knows how to do his jail. But he got, he got the senior brass's home addresses as yeah. well. Yeah. When I first met him, he told me that. He told me where Paul Spadano lived. He told me where, um, there was about five and he just said it straight out, you know. And he gave the names and addresses, the exact addresses, not, not the suburb, you know, the, the street name, the, the number. And he told me once what he did to a prisoner officer at Pentridge was this, this officer upset him. So he knew the bloke's name, so he got one of his people to look up on the electoral roll in those days, where the bloke lived. So he got the address, he knew all those houses well, the old A.V. Jennings house. So he just said to the prison officer one day, what are you going to do, you know, when you walk in your house and you've got that hallway, then you've got the bedroom on the left and the lounge on the right and then you've got that other bedroom. Now your kids are gone, what are you going to do with that? And he said, the bloke's just looking at him thinking, you've been to my house. Like, that's how cunning he was, you know, he just knew how to get under your skin. Some prisoners just didn't cause any problems for Paul or any of the other officers. You, you work it out. The, the better prisoners are the ones who don't hassle you because they're smart enough to know it's not worth it. The bikies are very good normally. Any unit you put them in, they run that unit. They don't want trouble, so they'll police it themselves. And I found most of them pretty good guys. I did a lot of boxing with a lot of them. I used to box with Johnny Walker, who was the Sergeant of Arms of the Banditos. And you wouldn't meet a better prisoner. I used to always think, you know, he shouldn't even be in jail. Like, he, they beat a bloke to death outside the Banditos clubhouse. And, you know, blokes like Johnny, he'd already won a version of the world title, you know, and um, the guy was seriously good, you know, and should, you know, should be enjoying his life outside, you know. It's just, it's one of those things where you can't help but think, you know, he could have been so much worthwhile outside instead of being locked up, which is no good to him and no good to his family and... You know, and, and like I said, most of the, bo the bikies, I did a lot with the Comancheros. Like, there was a bloke, Amir Jaha, who was the bloke who hit me the hardest. Like, he was just a monster, you know. Like, I used to wear, like, double protective stuff to take his punches. And, um, you know, like, but he's an absolute gentleman, you know. Machine Gun Charlie in Autovic was a kickboxer and a habitual drug dealer. He was smart, funny and cunning. Yeah, he was a... The best prisoner, I think, that I've met. And just that Charlie was very solitary and Charlie would just do whatever Charlie did, you know, and he's about as honest as you can be for a prisoner. He would never lie to you. If he didn't want to tell you something, he just wouldn't tell you, you know, like never lagged on anyone, didn't do anything like that, you know, and, and we built up like a rapport just through boxing and Charlie was kickboxing and, and we started talking, you know, and Charlie would just tell me things just about the way you should be as an officer and what you should do and what you shouldn't do. And he'd tell me things that he thought would be important to get to management. Like he'd tell me about how his visitors would have to wait two hours to get in. Because in Port Phillip to this day, John, when they opened up, I think it was about 500 prisoners. Now they're at the capacity is about 1,200. They haven't changed the visiting rooms or the waiting rooms at all. So what was built 
to that now has more than doubled in size. So the visitors sometimes will be out in the waiting rooms for two hours. Now that's not fair. You know, we'd make him cups of tea because he'd come in the gym and I'd make him a cup of tea. You know, and obviously you're not meant to do that, but um, I had that much respect for him that I just, I just thought, no. Um, Charlie told you, gave you a lesson about going into a cell. Yeah. He said it to me, like, just because we were talking, it just come up in conversation. And, you know, I was talking about certain blokes and he was saying, what do you do? I told him, I said, it's up to them. And he said, you ever walked into a cell? I said, yeah. And he goes, have you walked into a cell after you've had a blue with the guy? I said, no. And he goes, well, look, I'll give you a heads up. He goes, if you do, be prepared to punch on. He said, it's not, you're not walking in to talk to him. You know, so if you walk into the cell, the bloke stays on the bed. He said, that's it, he's given up. But if you walk in, he jumps up, you know what to do. I said, yeah. And that was pretty much it. But I didn't want violence. Like, I'm not a violent person. I can be. I don't want to be, you know, and um, I don't believe Charles black and white. The Mockbell brothers, yeah, with Tony at the head, Milad and Horty as executives, ran a major uh, drug syndicate called The Company. Milad and Horty both liked coming to the gym, and when I worked in the gym, you know, uh, a prisoner came in who shouldn't have been in there. I went to go over, and Milad said, leave it with me. He just tapped the bloke and walked him straight out, you know, like, no. Whereas a lot of the other prisoners, if one of their mates come in, you know, they want him to stay and they'll go through, oh, no, he can stay, he can stay, you know, and you argue with him for 10 minutes. Uh, Millad and Horty weren't like that. You know, they were very straight up and down. They didn't, they didn't deceive you in any way. Uh, one of them bragged about his holiday. Uh, they'd just be talking about their holidays and, you know, asking you where you went and, if, you know, one of the blokes I work with had a holiday home up at Rosebud or something and, and then they started talking about Sorrento and we thought they were talking about the peninsula and they were talking about Italy, you know, and then um, they apologised because they said, oh, look, sorry, we didn't mean to, you know, be, like, talking down to you, but, you know, yeah, it would come out about the money, but most of the prisoners do. You know, they, they all tell you they're not junkies, they're dealers. Like, it's, it's the hierarchy. You know, you'll see the, the lowest prisoner and yet he'll tell you that he's this, you know, I'm on the outside, I've got this, I've got that, you know, and you go, oh, yeah. You know, like, you, you work it out. The, the better prisoners are the ones who don't hassle you because they're smart enough to know it's not worth it. Melbourne identity Mick Gatto did 14 months in prison after he was charged with murdering hitman Andrew Veneman. He was acquitted. I didn't have much to do with Mick. When I first started, he'd... Um, when I first went to Charlotte, it was when, around about when he was going to get out. All I know about Mick was that he was very quiet. Um, they used to lock the whole jail down when they'd make a move with him because they were very concerned about his safety, which I don't think there was a concern, but I understand, you know, that, you know, because he was such high profile. So the whole jail would be locked down, you know, so if he had to go to outpatients or visits, they made sure that there was nobody you know, about, and that was it. But nobody had a bad word about him, you know. Um, they always said he was very polite, you know, didn't cause any issues, you know. But you find that with the, the proper ones. You know, it's the plastic guys that you, you bother about. You can hear Mick Gatto's story in the episode called The Best Defence is Self-Defence. Jail is part of the top-level criminal life cycle, at least that's what Paul got told. How they take it, John, and another prisoner told me this, he takes jail as income tax. Like, you've got to pay tax. If you're going to live that life, you're going to go to jail. So when he gets locked up, that's his tax. I'm just paying tax, you know. And he, he weighs it up whether it's worth it. And the only problem I have with that is when you're a shit crook. You know, if you're just breaking into houses or cars and there's no, no great reward there, I don't get it. But when you're talking about the mock bells or the Hadaras and all this, you're talking millions and millions of dollars. You know, they're, they're not into low-level stuff. They're into, you know, the very top end of it. 
So, When it comes to getting alcohol or drugs into prison, there was a few ways it was happening. There's always been a lot of drug use, and, and if it's not drugs, it'll be like, um, you know, sly grog or something. Um, there was an officer that was paid to bring in a bottle of whiskey for Travis Eads. Travis Eads was one of the prisoners Paul got to know during his time inside. They became quite friendly. You know, Travis Eads, um, Travis has told me about it. You know, he only paid him 50 bucks. Like, but he brought in a bottle of whiskey and Travis was off his head one night, you know, pure whiskey. So, um, you know, there's, there's so many ways they can do it. Like where Port Phillip is, it's surrounded by paddocks. The paddocks aren't fenced off, you know. People could drive up to the fence, throw stuff over the walls if they, if they knew where they were. The crooks could get it in the morning. So when we come in in the mornings or when we used to come in, you do a perimeter check as well where you're meant to walk around the yard and look for things that could have been thrown in. And, um, you know, but they still do it. You know, like, because so many of the units are so close to the wall, and if somebody, you know, knows, it's pretty easy to do. Over the years, Paul O'Sullivan has observed the toll that prison can take on families. When you see so many decent people that are affected, because even the prisoners tell you, we don't do the jail, our families do. Because jail's nothing to the hardened crooks. Like, they come in, they get everything they want. The jail, the punishment is for the, the families. You know, they're the ones that have to line up to get in. And The job takes a toll on the officers too. Yeah, I've got uh, post-traumatic stress. That's, there's other things that happen with that. I had, I had a daughter from my first marriage and she committed suicide when I was working at the jail, having my throat cut. Um, uh, then I married again to a lady at the jail and now she's got terminal cancer. She was 15 years younger than me. And, you know, I sort of lost my way when she was diagnosed. That was about three years ago. Uh, she was only 44 then. She had a stroke. And then they found she had bone cancer and breast cancer and cancer everywhere in the back, in the liver and now they're scanning her brain because um, they think there's something there. She's outlived the expectations they had on her. Um, I've, I've said it, I've posted on Facebook, I've posted everywhere. I'm not the fighter in the family she is. Paul O'Sullivan has finished being a prison officer. He now runs a business supplying martial arts gear in line with his lifelong love of boxing and combat sport. But Jay will always be part of his life and he has the scars to prove it, both physical and mental. Because the trouble with being a prison officer is you don't, it doesn't qualify you for anything. You know, it's not as if you can go out and build a house or anything, you can't. That's what you do, you know, and, and that's why my biggest thing, my, the best thing I ever did was build a rapport with the prisoners. I can go out now anywhere and prisoners will come up and talk to me, you know. I've, you know, Travis Eads, we're friends on Facebook. I saw him at the boxing and we were laughing and talking, you know, like, that's when he told me about, you know, um, the guy bringing in the whiskey for him. And, you know, it's just, it's just the way it is. This episode was produced and edited by machine gun Margaret Gordon. Mixed by Cool Hand Cormac Lally. Audio is by the Ages Gun Nicole Purcell. Tom McKendrick is head of audio. I'm John Sylvester. Thanks for listening.